On behalf of the Area Agency on Aging at Pasco Pinellas, I welcome you to Aging on the Sun Coast. The National Center on Elder Abuse reports that one in 10 Americans aged 60 and over will experience elder abuse. A New York State study found that for every case of elder abuse that is reported, 23 are not reported. Elder abuse is recognized by experts as a public health crisis for which there are no socioeconomic borders. On today's program, we will talk specifically about one form of elder abuse, domestic violence in later life. I'm pleased to have with us Kathy Cornwell, the Senior Victim Advocate for the Area Agency on Aging, and Lyd Needs, the Program Director for the Salvation Army Domestic Violence Program. We also welcome Horatio, and shortly we will learn about his sad story. Thank you both for joining us today um, and for Thank the you for having us. Um, I know, Kathy, we've had you before and we've had um, Horatio before. And yes. our audience mm -hmm. is always interested in why we have a dog on our show. So perhaps you can start by sharing his story. Certainly. Little Horatio there is my um, hero. He is an unbelievably a uh, dog that has been through so much and has come out so wonderful and loving. He was the victim of uh, abuse in an elder abuse case. He would take himself and lay on his elder owner mm -hmm. to protect her from the blows from her son. And as a result, if you Obviously, he wears the glasses. Due to the bright lights in here, he does have um, some residual from uh, left over from that. He has a little dent left in his head, and the one eye does not react well with the uh, lights on it. So we do have to worry about protecting his um, his eyesight from that. Um, it took about a year for us to rehab him. Uh, after everything that he had has been through, but uh, he's come through as a as a trooper, and he's an excellent advocate. He's our four-legged victim advocate for Pasco County. And I know he frequently accompanies you to speaking engagements, and it's yes. always a connector for us when we talk about this topic. So he yes. was beaten so badly that he has permanent damage and a dent in yes. his head. Yes, permanent damage. Uh -huh. But uh, he was but shielding his. His owner. owner, who was an older woman. That's yes, and and the the part of it is when you have an, a pet and, and a senior, they're so attached to him is mm -hmm. that she was so afraid that he would hurt the dog that after a couple of years she couldn't take it anymore, and she finally went. And, and walked like three miles to get to a, a place where she could go in and say, I'd rather be dead than have my dog hurt or me hit anymore. So the, the son was physically abusing her also? Physically, emotionally, and financially. Um, he would threaten to go home and kick the dog if she didn't go with him and take money out of the ATM for him. He would threaten her if she was on the phone talking to other family members. If you say anything, I'm going to hurt the animal, because that was that was her love, that was her connection, and what kept her going. So he was completely controlling the situation. Yes. He used this to gain power over her. Correct. And then a lot of people who do have pets, who are in those situations. Mm -hmm. um, they don't know where to go or how they would get out of the situation mm -hmm. due to the fact that they do have pets. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas like Lynn, they have a, an excellent program now mm -hmm. where they include that so that a person can get out safely and not have to worry about their pet. The mm -hmm. pets will be provided for. And that's really important because to control human victims, oftentimes the animals will suffer. Um, mm -hmm. We've had cases where children and and adult victims have uh, witnessed their pet being tortured or killed and that's a sign from the abuser that you know you need to be compliant with me and so to leave that beloved pet behind when they know that you know that could ultimately lead to the death of that pet or torture of that pet 
uh, it's important that we have a space, and we do at, at most of our shelters in the state where a victim of domestic violence can bring their right. pet with them to make sure that the pet is safe. Excellent. Now, when we had the uh, family down for um, Horatio and his family, the rest of the family that flew in had no idea what was going on, and they had no clue that it was their brother, one of her sons, the who abuser. was abusing her. And um, how long she did it go never. On? Well, as f we don't know for sure how long, mm -hmm. but we know definitely for at least two years that they've had that they had the dog. Mm -hmm. um, she was going through that, and she wouldn't tell her family because she was afraid they would come down, and then they would get in trouble if they went after the abuser. Okay. So she did not want them involved. So that was another tactic he was using uh, against her. So make sure you don't tell the rest of the family. So they were horrified when they came down. And we sat down and talked to them and, and worked with them. And um, they were going to take her back up north. But they couldn't take the dog. So they were thinking of putting the dog down. Mm -hmm. Because his face was bashed in a lot more. Mm -hmm. He you know, didn't look presentable to a lot of people. Wouldn't be able to place him. And so that's when um, Jane from the sheriff's office and myself were out at the crime scene. And that's when we decided we would take the dog. Mm -hmm. So that's how we ended up with um, Little Horatio. Although Little Horatio is not his real name. He is the only dog I know about that's in a pet protection plan. <laughs> <laughs> but, the abuser said whenever he gets out, he's going to come back and kill the dog because that power and control, nobody else could do or take care of that dog. If it wasn't him, he'd kill the dog. So as a result, we, we um, call him. When he's working, he call, works under the name of little Horatio. And he seems to be leading a very good life now. Yes, he, he does. He leads a very good <laughs> life. Everybody loves him, and, and he has just grown into this terrific therapy dog. And, and his original owner was able to go on and live a good life with her other family members. It was just a matter yes. of making that report that put the wheels in motion to, to, to bring some quality safe. of life. And she had a wonderful life after that with the rest of her family up north. And uh, we stayed in touch. Mm -hmm. And I would send her pictures of her dog. And she was thrilled to, to get those and know that he was doing mm -hmm. fine. That really gave her that lift that she needed to know he's OK, he's OK. Yeah. Um, and little Horatio's story brings us to many types of abuse that were going on there. You're talking mm -hmm. about physical abuse where yes. the elder was harmed uh, mm -hmm. physically, yes. um, financial abuse, she was exploited, um, and then the emotional, emotional abuse that went on. And Lynn, are these common mm -hmm. um, elements of domestic violence in later life? They, they are. Um, whenever you have domestic violence, the whole idea is to control what the victim does, how the victim acts. And to gain that compliance, there are certain things that go on. Mm -hmm. And some of those are, um, you know, that can be the first sign. Pet abuse can be a key if somebody in the neighborhood is noticing that a pet is being abused. Right. Oftentimes, that's the first sign that domestic violence is actually occurring in the home. Besides the emotional abuse and physical abuse and economic abuse, you know, the mm -hmm. financial control of monies, sometimes it's that isolation. Uh, Florida is a big state for that. Um, a lot of times yes. people are transient down to Florida and, and they think if they come down to Florida, it'll be a better situation. Unfortunately, it doesn't change behaviors that, that they were experiencing up north. So being isolated and not having a phone and, and having uh, limited contact with other people mm -hmm. is a desire that the abusers want also. It's less likely that their crimes against that person are going to be reported. Um, if you ask a victim of domestic violence, and we do this often in our support mm -hmm. groups, um, which is it that's worse on them, the physical abuse or the emotional abuse, and they will 
almost 100% tell me that it's the emotional abuse. It plays back in their mind. They start doubting themselves as to their capability. And when you add the layering of they may be failing in health, mm -hmm. they may be fa failing in memory, um, those types of things really play into the batter's hands because they can discount um, what that victim has to say to the authorities or what that victim has to say to the doctors and they can say, well, you know, the memory's not there. And so it's really important that we guard those seniors um, very diligently and that we are the eyes and ears uh, of our community to report such abuse that's going on in many homes in our communities. And we are re we are required to report, and that is so important when we talk about mm -hmm. only one in 23 cases are reported. And with this dear woman, mm -hmm. um, reporting made such a difference. It was the beginning of a yes, quality a of quality life for of her. Life. Um, exactly. And mm -hmm. so we as a community need to be eyes and ears. We can't assume that someone else has reported it. We need to Absolutely. take responsibility um, to make that report. Um, what are some of the other signs, Linda, that, that, we sh that should be red flags to, to us? Well, it, it, and when you're looking at those signs, it can be that that person doesn't have control of certain things in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it can be the clothing that they wear. Sometimes they wear inappropriate clothing. I mean, it's okay. Florida. It's hot. Mm -hmm. If you're seeing somebody that has long sleeves on all the time or, um, you know, sometimes batters are very um, methodical. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times abuse, whenever it's domestic abuse, a lot of their attacks will be to the head because the mouth talks. They're trying to gain compliance. They're trying to quiet the victim. So you'll see a lot of injuries to the face, to the head. But sometimes it's methodical enough that it's in the areas that would be covered by a bathing suit. Okay. You know, so those injuries, um, they sometimes won't have access to their own bank account information. We've had people that don't have a key to their own home. Um, sometimes it is that fear, um, poor eye contact, because they're afraid to, to look up. And, and they won't be able to choose things sometimes for themselves because they're so used to having people make that decision for them. Um, we often have people that that just have no idea, especially in the elder abuse, because mm -hmm. domestic violence shelters and those resources really didn't come about until the 70s. So if you have a person that's older, mm -hmm. um, they may not have any idea that there's a resource out there to help them. And we've had women in their, in their 70s, 80s, and 90s come into our shelter because of domestic violence. It's been there grandchild, their child, and sometimes their husbands that, mm -hmm. that they've gone through a lot of years with. And that doesn't mean that we don't get male victims of domestic violence too. And um, sometimes it's the same thing. It's a relative, it's somebody that should be cherishing them and keeping them. Unfortunately, they're abusing them. And you have to make sure too that we get the message out that if you have a neighbor, a senior, mm -hmm. um, such as Horatio's owner, she lived in a residential area, and every time she came out of the house, if the neighbors were there, she was not allowed to talk to them. Mm -hmm. They would say, how are you? And the abuser always answered for her. Mm -hmm. And that was a big, big red flag. That's a red flag. Yeah, Absolutely. so we have to make sure everybody's aware of these things to look after people. I guess when I think of domestic violence, I think of it as, as a relationship between intimate partners, but you're expanding my mm -hmm. view of that mm -hmm. to, um, it can be anyone that with whom the um, victim has a blood relationship with or is in another it's, relationship with. It can, be, it can be that they are related by blood, mm -hmm. that they are related by marriage, are living together as if a family mm -hmm. um, or share a child together. So those types of, of relationships are, are our primary focus. So if, when you're talking about blood relatives, you're getting into the grandkids, you're getting into the children. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why with elder abuse, we're a little bit more aware um, because we get, we, we service each other. Kathy and I uh, work together. We work some of the same cases together because what one, one agency can't offer, possibly the other one right. can. Well, and we find so many of our elder victims have a need for services, whether mm -hmm. it's some financial resources mm -hmm. or counseling 
or um, perhaps going to a congregate meal site so they aren't so isolated. Right. And Kathy, right. I know you you know very well how to make those connections. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to take a break now. We've, I hope, given our audience some idea about the scope of domestic violence in later life. And during the second segment, when we come back, we'll talk some about the resources that are out there and the responsibilities about reporting. So I hope you'll be back after this break. Look, here's a charge for something we didn't order. Good catch. I don't think you should ever pay for any bill unless you have first made sure that all the charges are correct. Speaking of which, have you heard of the latest Medicare scams? Mm -hmm. This happened to my friend. A man came to her door claiming he was from Medicare. He had a smooth line about helping seniors with the high cost of their medicines, but she had to give him her Medicare number right then before the deadline. Well, when she got her Medicare summary notice, it was full of charges for services she hadn't received. Turns out this guy was a scam artist. Medicare already has everyone's number. They wouldn't need to ask for it. Scams like these hurt every taxpayer, draining billions for Medicare and making it harder for people like us to get the health benefits we're entitled to. So I did something about it. I joined the Senior Medicare Patrol, where I work with other volunteers to teach my neighbors how to protect their Medicare numbers, review statements to spot false charges and detect errors, and report suspected fraud. Welcome back. During this segment of the show, we will continue learning about domestic violence in later life from Lynn Needs, the program director of the Salvation Army Domestic Violence Program, and Kathy Cornwell, our senior victim advocate for the Area Agency on Aging. Um, we talked during the first segment about little Horatio's story, where both he was abused as well as his owner, who was an older woman, um, and pointed out um, many of the circumstances regarding elder abuse that does exist in our community. We need to be alert to it. Um, Lynn, you discussed some of the signs, but what turned the tide for both Horatio and his owner was when she finally made a report. Um, but we as neighbors, family members, we should be making those reports also if we have any suspicion. Absolutely. Lynn, tell us how we go about doing that and how that's handled. Well, if you have a suspicion, I mean, we need to as a community um, join together mm -hmm. um, and, and make those um, calls out to get help for our fellow citizens. Um, you can call the the 1-800 number, and it's 1-800-96-ABUSE, and that's 1-800-96-ABUSE, and you can do it anonymously. You don't have to give your name. If you suspect someone, whether it be a child or whether it be a, an adult or whether it be a senior that is being abused, that phone call out can save a life. And we've had some neighbors actually for our program that have noticed um, people um, in people in their neighborhoods and uh, actually have called our crisis hotline and said, mm -hmm. how can I help? And we actually have safety planned with them and they've um, actually taken the step forward to rescue a person who's in domestic violence and, and get them into a safe location. So it's really important. And one of the things that we have with um, our seniors that we have to remember is self-neglect is mm -hmm. also a form of abuse. Mm -hmm. And so we try to make sure we have resources there for that and have it reported as well. Absolutely. It's important for the caller to know that they don't have the responsibility to investigate. They don't have the responsibility Absolutely. to be the resource for the resolution. They just need to start the process. <coughs> um, we are going to run the telephone mm -hmm. number for your crisis line at the mm -hmm. Salvation Army, Lynn. Um, and we also will be running the telephone number for the state domestic violence hotline so that if anyone themselves is a victim or um, has concerns, they can make place a call and that will start the resources Absolutely. to be put into place. Absolutely. Lynn, explain to me, um, there are a number of shelters throughout our community. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, yours on the west side of Pasco, there's Sunrise on the east side, mm -hmm. and then of course in Pinellas we have Casa in North 
in South Pinellas and the Haven in North Pinellas. What are, what are shelters able to offer, particularly to older persons? Well, we're able to offer a safe haven. Um, oftentimes, if, if the abuser is the caregiver, um, we will work with the agencies so that if they need a caregiver to come into our shelter as they're transitioning into a safer living mm -hmm. environment, um, home health care people will come in. Um, also, you know, we've had family members actually accompany someone who has a disability or, or needs some care um, so that they can come in and seek that. We provide everything cost free. Um, they come into shelter. Um, we have no expectations of them financially. All they have to do is is work with us and we'll find the resources. We make a phone call out to mm -hmm. Kathy um, and to make sure that they are getting the proper resources that are necessary. But it's a place where they can come and they can rest and they, they can heal. Um, we provide food, we provide hygiene, we provide everything that they can, they can use or need while they're in residence with us. Do you find that you provide services even before the point, or for some people who remain in the community, but also for people um, at the beginning of the discussion to to affirm for them that that this isn't a right situation, that they have the right to, to be safe, to provide some counseling to them, to help them to, vi to devise a plan? Um, Absolutely, because they can call our crisis hotline, and again, they can call it anonymously. Mm -hmm. Once they want to come into shelter, then we're going to get that information. But they can call anonymously and get that guidance, get those safety plans, get that reassurance that it is not okay, and especially if they've been isolated, they need that voice of, of reason that says, it's not okay for someone to hurt you no matter what you do, because oftentimes the batterers, while they are where they are committing the battery or they are performing the abuse, they will repeatedly say, I wouldn't have to do this if you wouldn't have. And especially caregivers that, that you know, if the person has had an accident or, or things like that, they reiterate that as the abuse is going on, that it's the victim's fault. So we need to make sure that the victims are hearing that no matter what you do, it is not your fault if someone is abusing you. And the important part, too, when it comes to elder abuse is that it's a whole different generation. Mm -hmm. So when they hear the word shelter, mm -hmm. they automatically get scared mm -hmm. and they say, oh, what's it going to be like in there? Mm -hmm. Am I going to get a cot? Or mm -hmm. they have no um, idea of how beautiful the shelters are and how well the staff yeah. takes care of them. And we're, we're an eight bedroom house with six bathrooms and our offices, we kind of say our offices just happen to be there. Um, a very home-like setting. Absolutely, yes. and that's our goal is that um, you know, when you hear shelters, and a lot of times it's that gymnasium with a bunch of cots in it, it is, it's not that environment okay. whatsoever. It's not the hurricane shelter. Absolutely not. Um, I think it's, important that we recognize, we've, we've talked about how frequently elder abuse is happening. One in ten um, elders are likely to be abused. And with dementia, that can increase to 50 percent of those with dementia. Um, we do have, there's World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, which is uh, June. recognized. Yes, that's June 15th. And because the elder abuse has grown so much, our seniors are the fastest growing population that we have, 85 and over. Um, so we, we definitely have the need and the information has to get out there. So worldwide now, the World Elder Abuse um, Awareness Day mm -hmm. has been declared as June 15th. And that is also uh, initiated by the National Health Association from the United Nations. Okay, so it is a global problem. Yes. Um, and long ago under the Older Americans mm -hmm. Act, there was money set aside to um, reach out to the community. We have an elder abuse coordinator at the Area Agency on mm -hmm. Aging. You serve in that function in Pasco County to get information out to the community about elder abuse. And we also, the Area Agency is one of only two area agencies in the state of Florida that receives money from the Office of the Attorney General for a victim advocacy program. And Kathy, you're our victim advocate in Pinellas, or I'm sorry, in Pasco <laughs> County. Sometimes we have you working in Pinellas County too. We have one there. Um, tell, tell us what you what you can step in and do to assist Lynn in meeting the needs of, of our elders. 
Well, the senior citizens have a lot of different um, ailments as well as the abuse as they age, the, mm -hmm. you know, infirmities. And so when that comes about and, and they need some mm -hmm. additional assistance, we, Lynn can call me and then I can contact our helpline mm -hmm. and we do have other services available. We can get a caregiver if there's a caregiver in there. We can bring somebody in to assist and mm -hmm. give the caregiver a break okay. um, because that reduces the stress. Mm -hmm. Sometimes our seniors are very ill and frail mm -hmm. and they can't protect themselves from the bullying mm -hmm. and some of the caregivers get overly stressed taking mm -hmm. care of them 24-7 mm -hmm. and then they become a little bit abusive and so we, we work with those groups to get people in there to assist and give respite care mm -hmm. and to help settle down some of those situations. So there are a lot of resources out there. Um, plus I will go and visit them at their home okay. if they need and meet with them and we can discuss it because a lot of our seniors don't drive. Mm -hmm. And domestic violence is a crime so this this may mm -hmm. end up in the court system. There are yes. some um, avenues that you can take, in, such as an injunction. You can help a person mm -hmm. with. What does what what does an injunction mean? It's an injunction for protection, okay. and that is a civil hearing with mm -hmm. a civil judge. Um, it is free, so anybody who's okay. a victim of a domestic violence um, can get an injunction for protection for free. Mm -hmm. They fill out the information. Um, Lynn has a victim advocate that can even help them fill out the information at the courthouse if they show up there. Mm -hmm. uh, if they call me, I can assist them mm -hmm. filling it out. And we also have an attorney that can work with them and accompany them to the hearings uh, to get that protection. If they are charged criminally, mm -hmm. then I will attend all of those court hearings, either with the victim if she wants to attend <coughs> or on her behalf. Because sometimes they get into court and they're so scared and they see that yes. abuser and they become very intimidated. Okay. So the, the most <coughs> important um, note that if someone feels that they are being abused is to take that first step to call. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be running the telephone number, the helpline, um, the Salvation Army's crisis line, as well as the statewide crisis line. Um, there are resources out in the community to step in and assist. Um, but if we, as a member of the community, feel that there is something suspicious going on, um, we also will have run that 1-800-96-ABUSE telephone number. Uh, that's where it starts to make that report to, <coughs> to put an end. Um. Yes, and there are some times where I will get a call from someone who's suspecting abuse, right. and but they're afraid to make the call. So they'll give me the information, and I will call on their behalf and give them all the information, and then I can work with that um, adult protective service person right. and say, you know, if it's founded, then just give me a call, and um, I'll be glad to work with them as well. So there, there is assistance through every step of the process. Mm -hmm. um, I thank both mm -hmm. of you for being with us mm -hmm. today and for our audience for absorbing all of the uh, valuable information mm -hmm. from our program. Um, and I hope you will join us for uh, future programs. Thank you.